This is going to be a very short video. When it comes to abdominal x-rays, there are only a few things that you need to understand at this point. And this video is designed specifically so that you can learn a basic approach and be comfortable with most abdominal x-rays that you're going to see. The utility of the abdominal x-ray in today's practice, practically speaking, is very limited. With that being said, abdominal x-rays are still ordered relatively frequently in a few discrete clinical situations. And I've listed a couple of them here and the sensitivity of abdominal x-ray in these clinical situations. First, for ruling out free air, say, in the setting of perforation, the abdominal x-ray is actually quite sensitive, but it's not 100% sensitive. In cases of suspected obstruction, the abdominal x-ray is actually not that sensitive. It's about 50% sensitive for small bowel obstruction. With that being said, there are some relatively specific signs for small bowel obstruction, but if the bowel gas pattern is nonspecific or bowel loops are filled with fluid, you can't really exclude small bowel obstruction. I want to make it clear that constipation is a clinical diagnosis. It is true that you can see stool in the colon on abdominal x-ray, but the colon is designed to hold stool. Most people are going to have some stool there. That being said, there are actually published grading systems for fecal loading. Classifying fecal loading as mild, moderate, or severe. However, studies looking at abdominal x-ray and constipation in general have shown poor inter-observer reliability and ultimately conclude that the abdominal x-ray has limited utility in evaluating for constipation. When looking for kidney stones, non-contrast CT and in special cases ultrasound are, are the test of choice. Abdominal x-ray is generally performed here to see if you can see the stone and if you can see the stone the idea is that you can follow it up with serial x-rays. Now let's move on to the actual imaging. Before we actually talk about abdominal x-ray it's important to know what we're looking at when we talk about x-rays. Simply put, an x-ray is created by shining an x-ray beam through something and then detecting it on the other side. In this case, it happens to be someone's chest. The principle here is simple. Tissues of lower density are going to appear darker, and tissues of higher density are going to appear brighter. When it comes to x-ray, you only need to know a few basic radiographic densities. We have air, which is a very low density and is going to show up the darkest, and very, very dense structures like bone and metal are going to show up as very bright. In between, we have fat, and then we have water and soft tissue. Fat is less dense than the water and the soft tissue. This is an example of an abdominal x-ray. So you can see we have the lung up here, which shows up as dark. Inside the bowel loops, we have gas, which shows up as dark. On the other side of the scale, we have dense things like bone that show up as very white. In between the two extremes, we have soft tissues. So this is the liver and the right upper quadrant. This is the right kidney over here. And the reason why we can see the outlines of these organs relatively well is because there is fat in between them, and that fat is slightly less dense. This here is called the properitoneal fat stripe. Don't worry what it is. The principle here is that the fat is slightly less dense than the soft tissues. Okay, so now that we know the very basics, let's move on to interpreting abdominal x-rays. So we'll start with this x-ray, and we'll start with a question. You're on call, and a patient's x-ray comes up, and you're being asked your opinion on this x-ray, and the question that they're asking you is, does this patient have free air in the abdomen? And you can pause this video and take a few seconds to take a closer look and then commit to an answer and resume the video. Okay, now that you have your answer, we'll come back to this x-ray in a second. As I mentioned, there are really only a couple basic things that you need to know and we're going to keep it simple. The first thing that you need to know when looking at an abdominal x-ray is how the patient is positioned. The main views are upright, supine, which means the patient is lying down and facing upwards, and decubitus, which usually refers to a lateral decubitus, aka the patient is lying down on their side. The second thing that you need to know is that air rises. So if you're looking for free air, you need to take these two things into account to know where to look. Think about how the patient is positioned 
and know that air rises. So back to our case. If you were looking under the diaphragm when we first pulled up this case, don't feel bad. It's a common mistake for beginners to make. You'll notice that the patient is supine on this film, which means that if we had free air, the air is going to come to the anterior belly and not under the diaphragm. Supine radiographs are not very sensitive for free air, and it's difficult to detect on supine films alone unless you have a very high volume of free air. You're going to assess for free air on every single abdominal x-ray, so it's important to know what to look for. There are a number of signs. Here are the few highest yield ones that you should know. Firstly, on upright films, you're going to look for air under the diaphragm. Here is an example of free air on an upright abdominal x-ray under the diaphragm on the right, but you can also see it under the diaphragm on the left. Here is the stomach bubble, and this is the free air right here. When the patient is supine, as I mentioned before, air moves to the anterior part of the abdomen. This can be detected as Wrigler's sign. Wrigler's sign refers to seeing air on both sides of the bowel wall. As a result, the bowel wall is very well defined. You should know that Wrigler's sign is, is probably one of the most overcalled signs by beginners. The reason for this is because you, have, you often have multiple bowel loops overlying each other and you can get a similar appearance of bowel wall simulating Wrigler's sign. Lastly, with air anteriorly in a supine patient, you can also get the falciform ligament sign. The falciform ligament is not usually seen on abdominal x-rays, but if there is air on either side of it, which there is here, you're going to see the falciform ligament pretty well. Okay, so as we already discussed, abdominal x-rays are often ordered to assess for small bowel obstruction. So it's important to be able to assess the bowel gas pattern. Firstly, you need to be able to differentiate small bowel from large bowel. The easiest way to do this is to look for the circular folds of the small bowel, which can be seen traversing the loop from one side to the other. The circular folds are called the valvulae conventes, also known as plicae circularis because they are circular. You can see the plicae circularis in all these small bowel loops here. All these loops centrally are small bowel loops. When you're looking for large bowel, you're going to look for hostra and see projections that go into the lumen but do not make it all the way across. However, sometimes you might see these folds in a certain projection making it look like they're going all the way across. This is a loop of large bowel, and this fold here appears like it's going all the way across, but this is colon. When it comes to assessing for small bowel obstruction, you really only need to know a couple signs. First, you need to look for dilated loops of small bowel. These are distended loops that are generally measuring over three centimeters in diameter. And you need to look for differential air fluid levels. You need to look for more than two air fluid levels that differ in height. A more specific sign of small bowel obstruction is to see air fluid levels that differ at least two centimeters in height within the same loop of bowel. So look out for that as well. So this is a supine film here and we have multiple loops of small bowel that measure to be greater than three centimeters. This is an upright abdominal x-ray and you notice several air fluid levels at different heights. You'll notice that some of these air fluid levels are in the same small bowel loop and differ in height. For example, this air fluid level and this air fluid level over here and over here. And again, if they differ greater than two centimeters, that's a very specific sign for small bowel obstruction. Okay. Now let's go through an approach to abdominal x-ray and discuss some pearls as to what you need to be looking for each step of the way. There are other videos and resources out there that go through an approach that may appear to be more detailed, but this one has everything you need to look for and is super easy to remember. First things first, of course, you're always going to start by assessing the quality of the film. This includes looking at what views you have, making sure that the whole region of interest is included, making sure it's the right patient, etc. But when it comes to actually looking for pathology on an abdominal x-ray, you can simplify it like this. 
First, we're going to assess for things that are very dark, aka we're going to assess for air. We start by assessing for free air, and we talked about that already. Remember, free air rises. Next, we assess the bowel gas pattern. You want to identify the stomach, small bowel, and large bowel. Notice their position, notice their caliber, etc. A subtle sign of an abdominal mass might be displacement of bowel loops. Lastly, you need to look for other aberrant air, which means air where it shouldn't be. For example, you may have pneumobilia, which refers to air in the biliary system in the setting of gallstone ileus. You may have gas-producing infection, things like emphysematous cholecystitis, where you see air in the gallbladder wall, etc. So, once you've looked for air, aka all the things that are very, very dark, now we're going to look for things that are very, very bright. And that includes lines or drains in the patient. That includes foreign bodies, like metallic things, clips from previous surgeries, etc. And that also includes calcifications. To name a few things that you might be looking for, things like gallstones, kidney stones, calcification of the pancreas with chronic pancreatitis, or calcified gallbladder, also known as porcelain gallbladder. Next, you're going to look for the organ outlines. You're going to look at the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, and the psoas muscles. As I mentioned before, the reason you can actually see the outlines of these organs in most patients is because the soft tissue organs are surrounded by fat, which is slightly less dense than the organs themselves. If you have a patient where you can't make out the organ outlines very well, it could mean one of two very common things. One, the patient may be cachectic and not have much fat around the organs to outline them well. Or the patient may have massive ascites where the fluid obscures the borders of the organs. Lastly, you're going to look for everything that's outside of the abdomen. You want to assess the lungs, the bones that you can see on the film, and the soft tissues. Okay, so let's apply this approach informally. We have an upright film here on the left and a supine film here on the right. And the history that you're given is abdominal pain, rule out free air. So once we've looked at the quality of the x-rays, we can start looking for pathology. Let's start with step one, looking at all the things that are very dark, aka looking for air. First, let's look for free air. So there's no free air in this patient. We look at the upright film and don't see any free air under the diaphragm. Next, we assess the bowel gas pattern, which here is nonspecific. You can see the stomach over here. This is all large bowel over here. This is transverse colon here. And there are some scatter loops of likely small bowel in the center. There are no dilated loops of small bowel. And on the upright film, we don't see any air fluid levels. Next, we assess for aberrant air, i.e. air where it shouldn't be, and we don't see that here. Next, we're going to look for things that are very bright. So that includes lines. We have a pacemaker wire overlying the right ventricle here. I don't see any foreign bodies or calcifications. Next, we look at the organ outlines. We can see the liver, the right kidney. The left kidney is difficult to see on the supine film because of the overlying bowel gas, but we can see part of it on the upright film. We see the spleen up here, and we also see the psoas muscles well outlined here as well. Lastly, we look at everything else. So we look at the lungs, we look at the bones that we can see, so the spine, the ribs, the pelvis, and the hips, and we don't see any acute findings. And then lastly, we look at the soft tissue surrounding, which is unremarkable. Okay, that's it for this very short video on abdominal x-ray. Remember our simplified approach. Secondly, remember the basic concepts. Always remember to look at what view you're looking at and remember that air rises. Lastly, the best way to get better at looking at abdominal x-rays is to look at as many cases as you possibly can. There are a number of more subtle findings on abdominal x-ray that can be important in certain situations, such as pneumatosis, aka air in the bowel wall. But these more specific findings are well beyond the scope of this short video. Remember, this video taught you everything you need to know about abdominal x-rays for about 95 to 99% of the plain films you're going to see. 
Okay, that's it for this video. Hope it helped. See you guys later.